channel and for those who want to review it it'll be up by tomorrow at noon time at www.backtobasicsministry.wordpress.com I will also send you an email letting you know that uh, and where to find it I always like to follow up with an email and um, for those who are not on line live with us we welcome you uh, via the, the, the video at the time that you come on and um, we miss you on the live program but we pray that this video will be a blessing to you okay we're into lesson four of our course communion with God we are one ladies and gentlemen we are one-third of the way through the course see you're rolling along we're one-third of uh, the way home okay so tonight let's let's start off I want to look on pages 7 and page 14 of your binder and we we'll, we'll make sure we have clarity on the lesson for this week and what's expected of you so if you'll turn to page 7, I'll give an overview of Lesson 4, the assignment to be completed, the related objectives. Then we look on page, uh, page 15, 14 and 15 to get the specifics of what you're to turn in for your lessons. I hope that this course is being a blessing to you. I'm getting good reports from you, and I'm excited. I'm excited about um, having the opportunity to teach this course to you. Um, we give honor to God and the Holy Spirit and our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God for Paul and Heidi Begley and um, the great work God has them doing. We ask that you pray for them every day. Lift them up before the Lord. Lift up this great ministry. This is a world-changing ministry. This school is going to grow. And uh, the school is going to be a blessing to a lot of people. We welcome um, Marcus Wolverton, who uh, teaches, will be teaching this course uh, next semester. Uh, glad to have you on board, Mark. And um, feel free to break in anytime you want to. Praise God. Okay, so on page 7 of your binder, let's take a look at what we're required to do this week, what we're going to accomplish this week in the lesson some of you have sent in lesson four already so this will be a review for you prayerfully read chapter four and appendix a of four keys to hearing god's voice be sure to read all of these assignments these assignments are very very important so prayerfully read chapter four and appendix a uh, of four keys to hearing god's voice and um the author Mark Verkler says prayerfully read because when we prayerfully read we get more than when we leisurely read or when we read under stress or duress prayerfully read chapter 2 and appendices a B and C of dialogue with God and so um, your first assignment in dialogue with God comes in lesson 4 so make sure you read the assignments in chapter 4 of keys to hearing God's voice and chapter 2 and the appendices in dialogue with God what I, I I do when I take these courses and I'm taking a new course that will be developed next semester I took the course you're taking last year and I spent like Monday and Tuesday of the week reading my assignments then Wednesday, Thursday, I started working on the questions, memorizing the scripture, and getting ready for the self-test, and whatever other paperwork that was required. So you map out your schedule based on the time that you have, and uh, if I can help you with anything, we'll certainly be glad to. Uh, also, complete the related exercises found in your student notebook. We'll see this on page 14 of this binder when we go to there listen to or watch session four of the teaching following along and taking notes in your learn notebook we'll be listening to audio number four mark verkler uh, we'll be listening to that uh, in the next hour 
um, we probably will be get there, getting there before an hour. So we listen to Mark Verkler, Lesson 4. Um, one of the reasons why we play these during our online class is that we wanted to save you guys a bunch of money so that you wouldn't have to buy that entire set of audio tapes. So we play, we play it during our class and put it online in, in case you want to go back and review it. Memorize Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. This is your assignment for this week. Commit these verses to memory. Write it. Write the, the verses down on a 3 by 5 card. And, and take a portion uh, throughout the day. If you have a coffee break or a lunch break, um, a little bit of rest time, or um, I don't say study while you stop at a red light, but... No, find a, a time throughout the day where you can refer, just carry that 3x5 card around with you, refer to it, and before long, you'll have this scripture memorized. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, God says, so shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty or void without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. That's God's promise. That's, that's a prophetic word from God. He says his word will not return unto him void. And we ask you to memorize these scriptures because uh, if you're going to be involved in prophecy or preaching or teaching, Put this word in your heart. Tuck it in your heart. Uh, once that word is in your heart, it's there. It's there. Uh, you might have to review it from time to time, but it's there. And we're looking at a time somewhere in the future where there may not be Bibles. Bibles may be outlawed, but you hide that word in your heart and be able to give somebody the word of God. Not your opinion, not the government's opinion, but what does the Lord say? And uh, God said, his word will not return unto him void. It will accomplish that which he has purposed for it to do. So uh, each day this week, read the corresponding devotional for that day from, well, the time you received your um, syllabus. You probably were guided to read the book Talking with Jesus, but if you don't have talking with Jesus, then the book you ought to be reading from on a daily basis is Freedom Diaries. This book, Freedom Diaries, it shows you how to uh, one man journals and, and what journaling has done for him and how it helps him. And this will help you to familiarize and become uh, uh, comfortable with your own journaling, with your own approach to the Lord. God's not going to speak to you and me in the same manner. He will speak to each of us differently. So as you read um, one man's sample of his journaling, you'll get an idea uh, of what God said to him, but God's going to say something different to you. We want to encourage you to enter into God's presence. Apply the steps that you, you're being taught in this course. Tune into spontaneity. Find a quiet place. Tune to spontaneity. Uh, tune to vision and write what God gives you. Or if God gives you a, a mental picture or a vision, write it down, describe it. And this way you are journaling. You have this before you. You set this vision before you. And um, Habakkuk said, I will stand on my watchtower and I will um, uh, stand on the rampart and I will watch to see what he will say to me when I'm reproved. And the Lord answered him and said, write the vision for the vision uh, uh, will take place. It will not tarry. It will take place. Write it down so that they who read it will run with it. And um, it's comfortable to know when you go to God and ask him a question and he speaks back to you. When you write it down, that is assuring. It is so, so assuring to know that God is speaking to you. And what he's saying to you he may not be saying to anyone else. He's God wants to develop our relationship with you. So I want to encourage each of you. Don't be afraid 
learn how to journal. You may say, well, I've been a Christian for 40 years. I've never done this before. Well, most of the church has not done this before. And that's why we have a lot of people in the church. They are so dependent on the pastor, so dependent on someone else to seek God for them. What if that person they're depending on has uh, and not does not have a good relationship with the Lord? What if that person's off base? You learn how to honor your heavenly Father for yourself, how to enter into His presence. God wants to be your friend. Communion with God is all about. God wants to be your friend. He made you, according to Psalm 139.4, fearfully and wonderfully made so that you might worship him, fellowship with him. So God is waiting on us to enter into his presence, to come into the Holy of Holies and talk with him. Let him do some talking too. He wants to say things to us. And so many people in the body of Christ do not give God time to say anything. We're so busy dashing hither, thither, and yon to and fro that we do not give God the honor or the respect to let him speak to us. And that is why people are listening to all kinds of voices. And Satan is, capital, Satan is capitalizing on the fact that he knows that the body of Christ is in a hurry. Uh, most are hasty. Many are lazy. Many do not take the time out to, to honor God. And there are, are, are those who are just putting in the time, you know, going to church, putting in the time, and thinking that is it. No, there's more than this. God made us to worship him, to fellowship with him. And so just like a marriage, if a husband's not talking to the wife and the wife's not talking to the husband, that's a sad, poor marriage. Well, God wants a relationship with us because he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to the cross to die for us. So we owe him. We owe him. Everything we have belongs to him. We owe our life to him. He's the life in us. And so allow the Holy Spirit to bubble up in you as rivers of living water. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. So with every situation, every question you have, every challenge you meet in life, you can go to God for yourself. This is what communion with God is teaching you. You can go to God, learn how to hear his voice, learn how to quiet yourself down, and enjoy his presence. Enjoy communion with God. Praise God. The Objectives of this course, we want you to learn Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. Uh, you will state the first key to hearing God's voice. And you will discuss how the voice of God is experienced and recognized. In your own words, discuss the meaning of the two Greek words, logos and rhema. So we want, I want to see your answer to that, logos and rhema. Logos is the written word of God, Genesis through Revelation. Rhema is the voice of God as God speaks to you. There's a, there's a logos, that's the Bible, Genesis through Revelation. But God also speaks uh, uh, through his spoken voice, through his voice, and gives us a rhema word. Um, the Bible covers uh, most of the situations we'll experience in life, but then God wants to guide us by our spirit, by his spirit. That is why... Uh, the scriptures tell us that out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. God lives inside every believer, and he wants to bring forth his word, his voice, through rivers of living water. And so oftentimes God will give us a rhema word. Then uh, you're going to state the Hebrew word for true prophecy. That's navi. It's pronounced Navi, N-A-V-I, but it's actually written Nabi. It's written N-A-B-I, but in the Hebrew, the B is pronounced as a V. So that word Navi uh, is very important. Then we'll discuss the differences between study and meditation. Uh, Dr. Verkler takes you in four keys to hearing God's voice, the difference between study and meditation. And he, he attacks that word study. Uh, the word study only appears in the Bible one time. 
but uh, we hear so many people, I've got to study, I've got to study, I've got to study. But Mark Verkler teaches us that, that we're to present our minds to God so that he can flow through us. We're to prevent our minds present not prevent present our minds to him so that the holy spirit will flow through our minds and um so we we take a look at that study and meditation study is left brain work meditation is right brain work study is uh, all about being technical and 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 left brain but uh meditation meditation might might be praying in tongues uh uh getting a revelation speaking a word of prophecy letting the right brain kick in um and it also includes visions and, and and dreams that god gives us and then we state and discuss the five senses of the spirit or the heart and let the spirit fill your senses these are all in chapter four uh you have to read your assignment work on your assignment and um, work on your um, the lesson that is required so flip in your binder to page 14 page 14 of the communion with God binder and then we look at the specific assignment that you're to turn in uh, this in this next week number one Write out Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. Whether you have committed it to memory or not, which is part of your assignment, even if you have not, memorize it. Write it out. Write it out. And ladies and gentlemen, don't go to gateway.com and copy and paste. That's the easy way. Write these words out. You learn these words. I find that as I'm writing out these scriptures, they're easy to recall. They're easy to recall uh, when you write the scriptures and uh, take the time and, and, and write them word for word. When you see yourself writing this, these scriptures word for word, uh, it enhances the learning memorization process. Uh, question, Jackie, did you have a, hey Jackie, welcome. Did you have a question? No, I was just responding to Mark. Okay, all right, fine. Okay, good. Good to see you on. Everything well in North Carolina? Going well. Okay, okay, all righty. Okay, be talking with you later. Okay. Number two, um, of question one, second part of that, using what you have learned about the four keys so far, journal about these verses. What does the Lord want to say to you personally right now about his promises? And so uh, we're talking about Isaiah chapter 55, 11, 10 and 11. Ask God and, and learn how to ask God. See, we were not taught this in church. Most of us were not taught this in church. This was brand new to me until about a year ago. And I've been in church for a long time. Uh, uh, you can tell by the gray in my hair. I've been around. I've been around the barn a couple times, Ted Rowe. I've been around there, man. But nobody ever taught me about uh, journaling and, and that I could talk to God and have a conversation with God. And I could find uh, a quiet place and tune to spontaneity and that words will be bubbling up in me on the screen of my mind and as I see these words write them down or as I hear these words write them down nobody ever taught us and so we've got the majority of the body of Christ who can't hear God's voice and and a lot of stuff we're getting in the church the brick and mortar is, is not edifying it is not building up the body of Christ much of it's not edifying a lot of, a lot of times it's off base but God wants to put us right smack dab in the middle of his will. Uh, question two of our assignment this week. Memorize key number one as stated on page 96 of the four keys to hearing God's voice. So memorize. Memorize your four keys to hearing God's voice. Recognize God's voice as spontaneous thoughts that light upon your mind. You may say, what do you mean by spontaneous thoughts? 
Well, God may not speak to you in, in, in paragraphs or in uh, multiple sentences. He may give you a word. Another word, uh, uh, you may be asleep and hear a word or a few words. Uh, write them down. I, I urge people to keep a notepad near your bed. Uh, if you wake up in the middle of the night with some words or word or scripture, write it down. Uh, don't wait until you wake up in the morning. Don't say, oh, I'll, I'll write that down when I wake up in the morning. Ladies and gentlemen, in the morning, it is gone. You're awake and it is gone. So keep a notepad near your bed so that if God wants to speak to you at night or during the night, uh, he will do so. And if you if you wake up and write that down, then go back to sleep uh, in the morning. God will refresh that for you. Number three, in your own words, discuss the meaning of the two Greek words, Greek words, logos and rhema. I just covered that, but you look, oh, read it in the script, read it in your assignment and determine the difference between logos and rhema. And the difference is basic. Logos is the written word. That's everything we have from Genesis to Revelation. But God also speaks uh, through his spoken word. Uh, God will give you uh, a word for the situation that you're facing. He may give you a word of knowledge to tell you why this is happening. He may give you a word of wisdom to tell you what to do about this situation. But as you listen to God, see, we're trying to teach you to develop a close relationship with God and not be dependent on anyone but the Holy Spirit. God wants us to be dependent on him. Yes, we're to listen to preachers, prophets, apostles, teachers, pastors, uh, even to one another. And we're to witness to one another. But we're not to depend on anyone. Depend on the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And he wants to bubble up in you. That's that Greek, uh, Hebrew word, Navi. He wants to bubble forth and speak to you, bring forth words and bring forth revelation knowledge to you. So you, you just find your quiet place and just get in the flow. Just get in the flow. Just jump in the pool. Let the Holy Spirit have his way. Number four, in your own words, discuss the meaning of the Greek words Nava, Naba or Navi. And Zaid, okay, one is uh, a bubbling forth and the others are gushing forth. Okay, so that Zid, Zid, Z-I-Y-D, Zid is not the way we want to hear from God because God's not going to speak that way. That's the way Satan speaks to us. He breaks forth. He pushes his way through. He robs the word of God. He tries to get you in unbelief and then he gives you something dumb and then but there are a lot of people in the body of Christ because they don't know God's voice they're picking up dumb stuff see Satan is an imitator and 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 uh, he's a disruptor and he's a spoiler and he's doing everything and that is why so many people are hearing so many voices uh, and and these voices are not of God so as we learn the voice of God and as we practice uh, staying in his presence and then we test the spirit by the spirit we are to test the spirit by the spirit any voice you hear and if you're not sure of it you test it by the spirit in other words you ask the Holy Spirit is this of God you study the word and if it's contrary to the, the word of God the logos then you kick you cast that thing down the Bible says we are to cast down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought obedient to Christ if you're a pastor if you're a preacher is preaching something dumb and it's contrary to the word of God you don't have to sit and take that mess ladies and gentlemen God wants us to hear from him we're to worship him not pastors not preachers not prophets not a people because they have a reputation for being spiritual or religious ladies and gentlemen God wants a relationship with us so, in your own words, discuss the ways that you can recognize God's thoughts 
and separate them from your own. A lot of times the thoughts that we get are our own thoughts, our own desires. Uh, and, and here's where, you know, as a teacher and having taken this course, I can tell whether my students are faking this journal or not, you know. Uh, a lot of times some of my students are asked to journal and I don't get any answer from them. They skip it. And I say, well, where's your journaling? Oh, well, it was too personal. Come on now, don't play games. Get serious. Get serious about journaling. And then uh, uh, if you don't know how to journal yet, then go back to the beginning of the course. Go back to Chapter 1 and take the steps. Learn. And it's going to take practice. It's going to take practice. I had a couple people finish that first course. And, 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 and Pastor Mark, you, 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 you might have had some. They finished that first course. They did not learn how to journal. They skated through. And, and I could tell they skated through because when we ask, what is God saying to you? They speak in the third person. They speak from the third personal point of view. Well, he, uh, uh, he, this, and she, or uh, this and that. But when God speaks to you, God's going to speak to you in the, in, in, the, in the first person. I love you, Mark. I love you, Christy. I love you, Jackie. And, and uh, uh, I've got plans for you. And so when you, when you write exactly what God says to you, uh, here's what God says to me. I love you, Leroy. I'm, 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 you make me very happy when you enter into my presence. That's journaling, hearing from God. And, and put write down what God says, not what somebody else said. I had someone journal a couple weeks ago. And um, I asked, they were to journal uh, what a certain uh, scripture meant to them. And so they began telling me what they had read from a book by, uh, um, um, let's say, um, any name a preacher, somebody who's written a book, and they quoted something out of somebody's book. No, that was not God speaking to them. They were quoting from somebody's book. We want you to hear the voice of God. And if you are not hearing the voice of God, then you need to contact me and I'll take you back to day one and we'll review that first chapter uh, we don't want you skating through this course just to get the credit or say I accomplished this course uh, uh, and I'll smile in Paul Begley's face because Pastor Paul gonna say hey go back and learn it right Paul will tell you no go back and learn it right we're not teaching you this for naught we want you to learn because the time is gonna come the time is going to come when you're going to be so glad that you learn how to journal, that you learn God's voice. The time is going to come and the situation will come when you'll be so glad that you took the time out to learn how to hear God's voice. And God might allow you, permit you to be in a situation where it's either his voice or destruction. So learn God's voice. God's not out to hurt you or zap you, but he wants fellowship. He doesn't want us faking it. He doesn't want us playing games. Learn this, ladies and gentlemen. So if you're having trouble learning how to uh, um, journal, you, you still don't know how to quiet yourself down, then you and I, we need to talk. We need to work, do a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to chastise you, but I'm going to take you back to day one, chapter one, so that you can get what you're supposed to get out of this course. Ladies and gentlemen, when you finish this course, Communion with God, you'll join a large number of people who finished this course before you, and they are witnesses. Wow, man, what a course. I can speak with God. I can hear his voice. And you know, that just does something for you when you know that you know that you know that you can enter into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. You can enter into his courts with praise. You can sit at the feet of the master and hear the master speak to you. Ladies and gentlemen, get it, get it, get it, get it. During the next few weeks, uh, 5B, deliberately be aware of occasions when you spontaneously receive thoughts which you now recognize. You don't have to do that part. 5B, you can scratch that off your uh, uh, syllabus. You don't have to do that part. 
Number six, in your own words, discuss the differences between study and meditation. Go back and read in uh, the four keys, learn the difference, and also in your learn workbook. In your learn workbook, Mark Verkler gives a diagram and illustration of the difference between study and meditation. Study is left brain work. I mean, your your ABCs, numbers, and uh, uh, technical stuff. We've been uh, memorizing things, studying, studying stuff, and memorizing, committing them to memory since kindergarten or preschool. But but uh, Dr. Verkler teaches us in this book how to include the right brain. Let the right brain uh, do what the right brain does, and meditate. Meditate. Meditation, ladies and gentlemen, when, when you can allow that word of God to rise up in you, to bubble up inside of you uh, like rivers of living water. Praise God. And um, Dr. Verkler said he spent, he spent many years uh, as a student, as a professor, uh, learning things. And then he learned how to live right-brained by letting his right brain and his left brain work together but including the right brain and learning how to walk uh, uh, based on uh, what he gets from God through meditation and so a lot of people are having trouble not a lot but some are having trouble meditating because you're not taking the time out to give God some time. Ladies and gentlemen, if your schedule is so busy, you've got to run here and there, you got to dash off and do this, and you're always busy, 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 how can you hear from God? You can't. You can't. And and if you're busy, 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 and you might be listening to a tape every now and then or go to a church and this and that, this this uh, uh, fellowship, you're going to hear something, but, but, but it's not going to be what God wants for you. So none of us ought to be so busy that we can't find time each day to give God some quiet time. Jackie and I, we have a prayer room, okay? We spend time in the prayer room, and that's a time that's private time. When Jackie's in the prayer room, that's pri private time. No phone calls, no interruptions. When I know she's in the prayer room, I'm not going to interfere. And the same with me, unless it's a real emergency, that's time when I'm fellowship with God I'm I'm uh, talking to God I'm listening to his voice and some and teaching myself how to live in quiet so many people don't know how to live in quiet the phone's got to be on the TV's got to be on the remote's got to be on I had a friend he was sleep with uh, uh, he and I spent a, a weekend in New York together and shared the same room and, and I looked over in his bed he had a uh, headset on his head he had the tv remote in his hand his head was at the bottom of the bed he was looking face down at the floor the tv was on the radio was on he was listening to a cd oh man he was most messed up and i just put earplugs in my ears and i just turned on my in my bed, I turned to to one side. And I began focusing on the Lord, but this 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 guy was having a rough time going to sleep. And God wants us to learn how to find quiet and peace in Him. So if your day is so busy, you don't have time for meditation. You don't have time for quiet prayer. You need to adjust your schedule. You need to adjust your schedule. Christians still have heart attacks. Christians still have strokes. Got to be doing this. Got to be doing that. Got to be doing this. Uh, Got to go here. Got to go there. Ladies and gentlemen, God did not call you to work yourself to death. God did not call you to be everybody's answer to everybody's problems. There are some times when people call me and I say, no. Hey, Ted Rowe, there's a word in the English language that's called no. N-O. Hey, Marcus, I say no. And, and I'm not going to be everybody's slave. I'm not going to be everybody's uh, uh, gopher. No. Mm -mm. I'm going to. And, and, and Jackie would tell you, I take a nap every day. Christy, I take a nap every day. 
every day between 4 and 6, 5 and 7. It's a two hour. Jackie says, it's not a nap, it's sleep. She said, brother, you're sleeping. Well, whatever you call it, that's every that's every day. Seven days a week, I take a nap. And and when I get up from that nap, I'm refreshed. And, and, and I don't care what's going on in Washington, D.C., or in Moscow, or in Havana, Cuba, or in Dallas, Texas, or wherever. I'm napping, and I'm going to get some rest, and that's quiet time, and God replenishes me, and then I can give him more quality time. And the rest of the day, the rest of the evening, the rest of the night, um, uh, I can do what he's, he wants me to do. So, but I'm not going to. See, years ago, when I was a young pastor, I thought I was everybody's answer, and, and I was supposed to do everything. I, I was the church janitor, uh, the the gopher. Uh, people would call me, Pastor, can you take me to the market? I don't have a ride. Uh, can you pick up my kids from school? I did all that, but not anymore. Hey, if your kids are stuck in school, they're just stuck. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that's cool. That's cruel. Anyhow, let's get on. Number seven, state, learn, and begin to use the seven steps of biblical, biblical meditation. That's on page 116. So this um, syllabus outlines everything you're to do and everything you're to turn in on your assignment. And um, the rest of this assignment is on the page, top of page 15. Okay? And we did discuss, I'll review this again, number nine. There's a list of things you're to meditate on um, in the use of the word rhema. But you don't have to write a paragraph on each word on that list. Just give a comprehensive paragraph on the whole group, okay? And then number 10, complete the personal application Bible meditation exercise on page 132. It's a personal application. Write it out. It says personal, but write it out. Okay, and these are the 10 areas that I, I, I like to receive from you in your homework for this week. Okay, that covers the assignment um, for lesson four. Are there any questions at this time? Pastor Mark, any questions? Anybody want to unmute your phone? Uh, yeah, Dr. Carter. Yes, Roy. Hey, can yeah. I tell my wife it's okay if I don't pick the children up from school anymore? Man, don't start that. <laughs> hey, Roy. <laughs> Roy, Roy. Hey, Roy. Jackie and I, we have a guest room here. Okay? We have a guest room. But I, I, I don't want any drama. Man. No drama. Look here, man. You pick those kids up. <laughs> oh, praise God. Bless you, man. Bless you. Anybody else have any questions? Christy, you have any questions? Okay, then let's just review um, the content of, of your lesson for the week. Look for vision as you pray. Look for vision as you pray. In other words, what do you mean? What, what's this writer mean? What, what, what are Mark and Patty Verkler trying to tell us to do? Look for vision as we pray. Ladies and gentlemen, when you pray, visualize Jesus. Even you intercessors, uh, you intercessors and, and cats, uh, you have an intercessory group. and you're, you, you're, you have intercessors praying for Pastor Paul and Heidi all the day long, and that is good. Um, as you intercede, and as you teach others to intercede, the people you're praying for, visualize Jesus standing over them. Visualize Jesus laying his hand on that person you're praying for. Visualize, if you're praying for a loved one who's sick, visualize Jesus standing uh, next to that person's bed. Or visualize Jesus comforting that person. And, and so... Uh, look for vision as you pray. Look for picture, pic picture. Uh, see the graphic. See the picture. Uh, see the visual. 
uh, of Jesus as you pray. Okay, Jesus often uh, revealed to his disciples. Uh, he says, "I I do what I see my Father do." Okay, Jesus was visual. I see what I uh, I do what I see my Father do. I speak what I hear him say. I speak what he shows me. So be visual. Um, Numbers 12, 6. Hear now my words. Is there, if there is a prophet among you, the Lord will make himself known to him in a vision. So God speaks to prophets in a vision. I will speak to him in a dream. Your dreams and your visions are are very important the things you see the uh, the the visuals you get write them down uh, later on ask God to give you clarification on what they meant uh, if you've got a spiritual advisor ask the spiritual advisor what they think about it okay first Chronicles Chronicles 29 18 O Lord God of Abraham Isaac and Israel our fathers keep this forever in the imagination of of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee that's Solomon praying for Israel he's asking God keep forever in their in their hearts give them a vision of you a vision of your word a vision of what, of what keep this forever in their hearts that they will be visual and see uh, uh, with the imaginations of their heart what you have provided for them John 5 19 Jesus said the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do for whatever he does the son also does in like manner so key number three look for vision as you pray so first of all you want to quiet yourself down you want to be like Habakkuk step number one quiet yourself down step number two look for spontaneity spontaneous words lighting upon the screen of your mind Number three, look for vision as you pray. And then four, journal. When you practice these four steps, ladies and gentlemen, you are getting much more than much of the body of Christ is getting today. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just share this with you. God is raising up, uh, and I pray today, and I ask him to continue to do this. Raise up an army of prophets, Lord. An army of prophets. Well, what is an army of prophets? An, arm, an army of prophets is an army of people who hear the voice of God and express it to others, who hear God's voice and tell others. See, these are the last days. It's, it's almost roundup time. And, and you're not in this school for, for naught. You're not in this school just to be exercising your mind or your brain. Uh, God is, is going to use you to help get people into the kingdom of God before it's too late. So learn everything that God has for you. Okay. Um, we, we want to encourage you, encourage you to keep your mind on Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, do not pray with an idol in your heart. Well, what's an idol in your heart, Pastor Carter? An idol in your heart means... If you've got a picture of someone or something as bigger than Jesus in your heart, it might be it might be sickness, it might be cancer. You're you're so uh, busy looking at that cancer and everything you're doing is praying about that cancer. That cancer becomes an idol, and the answer is going to come through the idol. Or if 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 you're let's say you're a pastor and you got a girlfriend on the side you you've been, you've been uh, uh, sneaking around with sister Suki and uh, uh, your wife doesn't know it or you think she doesn't know it. ladies and gentlemen it's gonna come out in the wash uh, uh, God's not gonna hear your prayers you can preach uh, like Paul you can you can sing like uh, 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 whoever the the great latest group is you can sing like an angel you can preach like Paul but it's going to find you out. It ain't going to work. Uh, if the scripture says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he won't hear me. If I know I got sin in my heart, if I know adultery is in my heart, if I know there's an idol in my heart, if I know the love of money is in my heart, if I know something is in my heart bigger than Jesus and means more to me than Jesus, it ain't going to work. So I want to caution you. Uh, Ask God to restore your visual capacity. 
and 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 renounce any idol confess any bitterness if you've got a root of bitterness in your heart god won't hear you uh, some people can't hear from god because they're angry with somebody who hurt them 10 years ago you just can't get over it i can't get over what they did to me you don't know pastor carter what they did to me yeah i know the bible says forgive but you don't know what my uncle abe did to me or or, or my cousin judy did to me you don't know it's hard to forgive but ladies and gentlemen if you can't forgive you can't hear from god it's, it's as plain as that if you're too bless god proud and too stubborn you're offended here's another reason why a lot of you can't uh hear from god you're easily offended you're so touchy anything triggers you off uh, i heard ken copeland preaching this morning he said uh a lot of heavy heavyweight people are angry with him because he said he, he was pre preaching about people who were overweight and who, as soon as he mentioned overweight people got offended ladies and gentlemen Ken Copeland said don't be so touchy and there are people in the body of Christ you offended me I'm offended ladies and gentlemen you've got to get over that offense don't let that offense take you to hell because if you harbor bitterness in your heart to somebody you're angry because somebody offended you and you won't forgive how do you expect to get to heaven you can build churches you can build cathedrals you can give all your money to the poor you can clothe all the naked feed all the hungry but if you've got aught in your heart against anybody i don't think their their uh, prerequisites for heaven have changed the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he won't even hear me. So repent, repent, confess. Don't let any idol be in your heart. Don't be like uh, the man in the Old Testament who prophesied for money. And, and, and the jackass had to roll over, stop and roll over on him and beat him against the ground uh, until some sense came to the man um, that he was he was only going to prophesy because he was going to get an offering ladies and gentlemen don't let that offering that money uh that material thing uh stand between you and heaven okay um that's about what i want to cover tonight um we've gone over the assignments that are you're required this week and now um we want to get ready to hear from Mark Verkler in about it's about a 50 minute 55 minute audio so ladies and gentlemen take about a I'm going to keep the recording on I want to give everybody a five minute break now Ted Rowe I'm looking for you in five minutes okay uh, Jessica I'm going to especially look for your name <laughs> in five minutes uh christy christy carpenter in five minutes i want you back here roy roy, roy you don't have to pick up the kids because it's 7 53 p.m so take a five minute break at 7 58 now it'll be 7 59 at 7 59 let's resume and then um we're here, Mark Verkler. Okay. I'll be here in case anyone wants to ask a question. We're taking a pause and a break for five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Those of you who are listening to the audio, you can take a four minute break from here on and then come back, okay? Take a five minute break and return at <clears throat> 7.59.
and gentlemen, so do not turn off your audio. Don't change channels. We're on a break for a few minutes. We'll be returning in about two and a half minutes. Mark Wolverton, I, I know you can't keep a notepad while you're driving, but um, you and God work that out. Jackie says audio notes. That's good, Jackie. That's good. Two more minutes and we'll be back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we're back, we're back, and um, let's continue, Father God, as we come off the break. Prepare us to hear as you instruct us through Dr. Mark Verkler. Bless each and every student. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for these tapes. Dr. Mark Verkler. know him as your dearest friend. He wants to give you wisdom, understanding, and revelation for every area of your life. All right, are you ready for one more session? <laughs> Here we go. Let's uh, pray and ask God to anoint this next session. Father, we just thank you again that we can come into your presence to hear your voice, to receive your instruction. Holy Spirit, we welcome you as the teacher in our midst. We open our hearts to you, we open our minds to you, and we ask that you would pour revelation into our hearts and our minds. And all God's people said, Amen. Four keys to hearing God's voice. The first one is to do what? Quiet yourself down. Second one, look for vision. Third one, tune to spontaneity. Fourth one is... Journaling. All right, we're going to talk about the first one. We're going to talk about spontaneity. Page 10 in your seminar guides, there's no order as to which one comes first. It's just four keys, and 
so we're going to work with spontaneity first tonight. We'll work on it for an hour now and maybe longer tomorrow. Okay. Key number one is to recognize God's voice as a spontaneous thought which lights upon your mind. We're going to say that God's voice, which can be called rhema. Let's say that word together. Rhema. Now, rhema is a Greek word in the New Testament. shows up 70 times, and about 67 of those times it it's, uh, means spoken word. So if you want to put equals, spoken word. The word rhema means a spoken word. When God speaks into your heart, that's a rhema word. When Satan speaks to you, it's a rhema word, according to the New Testament. And when you and I are talking, it's also called rhema word. So the New Testament calls all of that rhema word. Rhema means spoken word regardless of who is doing the talking. So when God's talking into your heart, it's called a rhema word. It's sensed as a spontaneous thought, spontaneous idea, spontaneous word, spontaneous feeling, or a spontaneous vision. The key word there is spontaneous, if you would like to circle it or underline it. So we're going to say that thoughts from our mind are what? Analytical and thoughts from our heart are what? Spontaneous. So if we wanted to move from our mind to our heart, we would move from what? Analytical reasoning to spontaneous flow. I want to say it again because that was important for me to learn. If I want to move from my mind to my heart, I move from analytical reasoning to spontaneous flow. I had asked people for years, how do I sense my heart? Because I knew God spoke from my heart. They said, it's the innermost part of you. I said, that's, that's, that's where it's located. How do I sense it? They said, it's a part that talks to God. I said, that's what it does. How do I sense it? No one could define how to sense it. I'm telling you how to sense it. Your heart is sensed as spontaneous thoughts, spontaneous pictures, or spontaneous emotions. Key word there is spontaneous. Now, biblical meditation will combine analytical reasoning with spontaneous flow together. How many of you have read the Bible and had a verse leap off the page and hit you between the eyes? If you have, say amen. How many felt that that was probably more than analytical reasoning? Was it? What was combined with analytical reasoning to make that verse leap off the page? Spontaneity. Spon revelation of God through, through flow, spontaneity was woven into the analytical process and the verse leapt off the page. If you find that to be a fun and enjoyable experience, would you say amen? How many have read the Bible and had no verse leap off the page? If you've done that, say amen. How many found that wasn't anywhere near as much fun? Now guess what? When you're reading the Bible and no verses leap, do you think that that is pure analysis? I think it is. How many would like to have verses leap every single time you read the Bible? Would you like me to teach you how to do that? How many hope I can? <laughs> I believe I can. I'm going to start with a question. Is it right to study the Bible? Yes. The Bible says what? Study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's found in what reference? 2 Timothy 2.15. Except if you have a newer translation of the Bible, newer than King James, it doesn't say study in that verse. I happen to have the New American Standard Bible, which is the one that Jesus uses. And uh, that doesn't say study at all. Actually, the New King James doesn't say study either. The New King James and the New American Standard both say this. They say, be diligent to present yourself unto God. It doesn't say study. It says, be diligent. Is diligence a little bit different than study? That's a lot different than study. Study is a function of what faculty within me? The brain. Which side of the brain? Probably the left side of the brain. Diligence is a function of what faculty within me? It's my heart. Diligence is an attitude. Attitudes are heart. So the Bible is saying, come to the Bible with a properly postured heart. Do you think that's significantly different than saying, come with a fully engaged brain? you think so, say amen. Well, I said, well, okay, fine. So that verse didn't say study, but, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of other verses that say study because I'm the president of a university and I went to college and I went to high school. And how many of you know study is fairly central in the Western educational process? Amen? So I said, I think I will just look up every, look up every single verse in the Bible on study just so I know for sure that God endorses it and loves it. So I looked up all the verses on study in the King James Bible. And I found a total of three. <laughs> I thought three. I said, God, 
That's not very wise on your part. Considering how significant study is, I think you should have mentioned it more than three times. And so here's the first time he mentions it. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. Too much study causes <laughs> weariness of the flesh. How many believe that that might not be an endorsement to study? I said, okay, fine. Well, we got one more verse, and I hope this other verse is a big verse on study because study is very important to the Western world, and it would be very nice, God, if you embraced it and endorsed it. The other verse on study in the King James Bible is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, which is study to live a quiet and peaceable life. And in the Greek, it's not the word study at all. In the New American Standard, it translates as aspire, make it your ambition to lead a quiet and peaceable life. So that's not study either. Which means we don't have any verse in the Bible at all recommending that we study it or that we study any book. Hmm. Does that bother anybody? I mean, I live in the Western world. I went to school for 12 years. I went to college for a bunch of years after that. Study was central. I said, God, I think we should chat about this. I said, I think I should educate you on the brilliance of the mind that you've given to us and show you that you kind of oversaw this whole thing. You kind of missed the boat when you didn't recommend study. And God said, Mark, let's talk about it. He said, Mark, I've got something actually better than study. Do you know what God has that's better than study? It is meditate on my word day and night. Joshua 1.8. 20 times the Bible commands us to meditate, and meditation, I believe, release, releases revelation to my heart, where study just releases information. So when I'm studying the Bible, I think verses probably don't leap off the page, but when I'm meditating on Scripture, I think verses do. Would you like to know the difference between study versus meditation? One person said, yes, that's enough for me this late at night. This is your chance to scream, yes, Mark, oh, I really care, please teach me. Okay, I realize it's late and everything. Page, page 12, all right, for those who are still awake. All right, page 12 is a view of study, Western, Western view of study, which is man, it's me using my rational abilities. Webster defines study as the application of, of the mental faculties for the acquisition of knowledge. And that's, that's what I did. I said, I'm going to apply my reasoning capacity, and I'm going to use it to acquire knowledge. So I said, yeah, that's, Webster, that's exactly what I do. All right? Now, if you look at meditation, this is a composite definition of the word meditate and meditation in the Greek and the Hebrew. We just wove all of that together from a strong concordance. When I meditate on the Bible or a book or God's creation, because I'm commanded to meditate on all those things, what I do is I murmur, I converse with myself, hence aloud, speak, talk, and babbling. Any idea what babbling might be? I'm praying in tongues. How many have prayed in tongues over the Bible? If you have, you say amen. All right, it's a wonderful way because it opens you up to flow. It's a great way to receive revelation. So yeah, how many prayed in tongues over another book? other than the Bible, and ask for revelation from another book. If you have, say amen. Well, you can all do that. There's no reason not to. How many of you know we would like flow and revelation in every subject area in the universe? Amen? How many know God knows a lot about every area, including science, health care, politics, prison reform? And you could pray in tongues over these books that describe this and get revelation as to how to improve every single one. Amen? You think that's God's intention for his church? Man, I believe it is, so that I can take revelation knowledge into the world and become a leader in transforming that area. Because how many of you know if we don't lead with revelation knowledge, it's going to be a messed up area? All right, so um, babbling. I'm going to pray in tongues over books. Why not? Now to speak, to, let's go back to the beginning, to murmur, to converse myself, speak, talk. How do I talk over the Bible? Well, there's lots of ways to talk over the Bible. I can just, I can recite a verse. Because when my mouth gets involved, it's a much deeper and more profound learning experience, has more impact than when my mouth, when my mouth is not involved, because life and death is in the power of the tongue. So I can speak life into my being. I can, I can put my name in. By his stripes, I, Mark Verkler, am healed. That's a way of speaking over the Bible. I can, I can say this. How come you said that you're going to keep watch to see what he's going to speak to you? Why didn't why did you say you're going to listen? How come you're trying to look? 
I can talk. I can ask questions. Those are all great ways to speak over the Bible, and I do all those things, all right? So let's go back to our definition. Speak, talk, babbling, communication, mutter, and look at the next word. <laughs> Roar. Now, that really goes over well in Toronto, praise God, because, you know, at Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, people love to roar and shriek and shout and scream and dance and carry on in all sorts of different manners. And, you know, some people don't like that. They, they kind of say, hey, you show me in the Bible where it says it's okay to roar, and then I'll accept it. If you can't show me the Bible, I'm going to reject it. And so, you know what? I wouldn't reject it based on that because it doesn't have to be in the Bible for me to accept it. All that's got to, all that's got to happen is it's got to be compatible with biblical principle. Is roaring compatible with biblical principle? Yeah, you look at the Psalms. He let out a shout before the Lord. All right, he danced wildly. I mean, roaring could surely be in there someplace. But if you actually want the verse saying to roar, guess what? All 20 times that God commands you to meditate, he is commanding you to roar. So if you're not roaring, repent and get on with it and start roaring like you're supposed to for crying out loud. Hallelujah! <laughs> I always think the best defense is a good attack. All right, glory to God. Not sure it's a scripture verse, but it works for me. All right, so um, you tell me when is the most appropriate time in your Bible meditation process to let out a roar? When you get revelation, when God hits you with truth and you say, yes! And you shout and you dance around the office and you have a party. If you've ever done that, would you say amen? <laughs> I'm in Toronto, of course. You better say amen, all right? So anyway, I do that. Revelation knowledge hits me, and I'll dance around my office, and I'll shout because I'm so excited because of what God has just shown to me. All right, so roar. The next word in the definition is to mourn. When's the best time to mourn in your Bible meditation process? When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. Amen? All right. Next word in the def definition is a murmuring sound, a musical notation, to study. So study is acceptable if it's a subcomponent part of a larger process called meditation. So if I wrap study with everything else, the, all the rest of these words that I'm describing, then I think study is acceptable. If I wrap it with, with murmuring and muttering and talking and roaring and whatever else, what else is the definition? Let's take a look here. A musical notation to study, to ponder, to revolve in the mind, to imagine. Is imagination left brain or right brain? Right brain. See, when I would study, I would use the left side of my brain only, analytical reasoning. But that's not the way God studies. He says, come, let us reason together. I say, oh, good, reason, logic, praise God, we're going to reason together. Next part of the verse is, though your sins be as scarlet, I'm going to make them white as snow. I said, what kind of reasoning is that anyway, for crying out loud? What is scarlet and white as snow? Pictures. When God says, come on, let's reason, he goes straight to the right side of the brain to do it. I say, you don't even know how to reason properly, do you? If you'd have been brought up in the Western universities, you'd have understood reason is logic. Now, how many think maybe God does know how to reason, and I should learn how to reason the way he does? Actually, the only command in the entire Bible for you and I to reason is that verse right there that we're quoting, which is Isaiah 118. Come, let us reason together with who? With God, the only command you and I have to reason is if I'm doing it together with God, which means for me, it'd be spirit-led reasoning. I'd be tuned to flow and saying, Holy Spirit, anoint my reasoning uh, and, and, uh, and, and lead me in the reasoning process. That's the only kind of reasoning that I know to do. It's the only kind commanded in the Bible, reasoning together with God. I'm never commanded to reason alone. My guess is this. When I reason alone using logic, no verses leap off the page. No revelation hits my heart. But when I reason using flow and pictures, which we would call that meditation, then I do get revelation that hits my heart. Let's take a look at the definition and see what else we missed. To ponder, to revolve in the mind, to imagine, to pray, prayer, reflection, devotion. So for, for God, meditation involves the heart. It involves me praying and saying, God, show me what's here. Tuning to flow, tuning to river, and letting flow guide the reasoning process. So now if you go to page 13, we have taken those words for meditation and wrapped them around a person's brain, and we found that in biblical meditation, 
every single faculty in each hemisphere is activated and used, and it's being activated by the Holy Spirit in your heart using that faculty. Now, if you think that's probably superior to you or me using one faculty in one hemisphere, would you say amen? If you think that's probably a thousand times more effective than me reasoning alone, would you say amen? Amen. See, that's what I believe. So in our university, Christian Leadership University, we do not allow you to study. If we catch you studying, we flunk you automatically. Praise God. You want to come to our school, amen? We only allow you to meditate. If I catch you studying, I squirt you with my squirt gun. It's as simple as that. How many think it might be fun to look at that chart, pray over that chart on meditation, and say, Lord, teach me how to move from study to, med study to meditation? If you think that'd be fun, say amen. I recommend you do that. In the weeks that follow this, I'm going to recommend you go back and do a 12-week course, go through this in depth, and you go back and you journal about that and say, Lord, show me how you want me to move from study to meditation. Ah, this is Einstein. I love Einstein. He's one of my heroes. He said, I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are details. If that works for you, would you say amen? This is a scientist. This is a scientist who came up with stuff that the world had never thought about before. He came up with a theory of relativity which reversed 500 years of scientific thinking, turned it upside down. How did he do it? Did he do it by scratching his head and saying, I'm going to think really, really hard today and see if I can't change the field of science? Not how he did it. Let me tell you how he came up with the theory of relativity. He said, I was laying on my back on a grassy slope. Which of the four keys to hearing God's voice is that? Stillness. I was gazing through half-closed eyelids, wondering what it would be like to ride in a ray of sunlight. Which of the four keys is that? Vision. Intuitively, the theory of relativity came to me. Which of the four keys is that? Spontaneity. I went back to my office and I proved it with mathematical formulas. Which of the four keys is that? Churnley. He used the four keys to hearing God's voice to transform the world of science. Say, that's neat. Say, I could do that in the area God asked me to do it in. You can do that in the area God asked you to do it. God, that's why, how, why God, that's what God calls us to do. Become a leader. Become a spirit anointed leader. Let me control your thought process. Tune to flow, flowing thoughts, flowing pictures. I'll anoint your reasoning, give you spirit anointed reasoning, just like I gave it to Einstein, and you can change your field. And then you can be the head and not the tail. You can lead and not follow. You can lend and not borrow. And you can change and disciple your nation. If you think that's exactly the plan, would you say Amen. Yeah, you and I taken the voice of God into our field. So I took it into education. I built a university with the voice of God in the center of every single course, requiring you to journal about that week's course and say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? It's the only university in the world that I know of that has done that. And I believe it, we will become a leading university because it's something unique and something different and something people really want. There's a lot of people who want that. You can do what I've done in the field that God's asked you to do. Then go into health care. Take the voice of God. Go into politics. Go into prison reform. Uh, you know, you name it. Right here. Okay, prophetic art. Take, take flow into the field of prophetic art. Amen? And just paint and create and draw things that are absolutely exquisite because they came from the Spirit of God, the throne of God through your hands. All right? And, and onto canvas. Handel's Messiah which is still good, 500 years later after he wrote it. Hallelujah. How did he get this? He said, I, I heard the music in the back of my head. I wrote feverishly for eight, for 21 days. What's he hearing? He's hearing the worship in the throne room of heaven. He's hearing the angels worship, and he's putting it on paper. And it's not haywood or stubble. It's good 500 years later. So I can do that in the area God asked me to do it in. See, that's my passion. That's God's passion. He wants you to take divine creativity, his voice, into an area and become a spirit-anointed leader. If you'd be willing to do that, would you say amen? amen? Amen. How many of that will take a little bit of practice, a little bit of getting used to? But once you get it, it's going to be a party. Amen? Amen. I'm hungry for the church to do that in area after area. And I want to ride on your coattails. You can ride on my coattails in one area. I can ride on yours in another. All right? And we can go to some really unique and amazing places. All right. That's study versus meditation. I'd like you to turn back, if you will, to page 7, which is the thing on left and right hemisphere brain function. We covered it last night, and we're going to just skip back to it for a moment. 
We said the left brain functions was things like reasoning, right brain was things like imagination and intuition. God gave us two halves of the brain, I said, so that we could not use them both, but we could do what with both halves of the brain? If you remember what I said, I'll give you an A+. Plus. So we could present both halves of our brain to the Holy Spirit to use. If you recall me saying that, say amen. Good, I love all three of you. Okay, that's great, all right. So, so we could present both halves of our brain to the Holy Spirit to use. That's, I think we're supposed to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Amen? How do I present the left side of my brain to the Holy Spirit so he can use it? Would you like to know how to do that? I'll tell you how I do it. I do it the same way Luke did it. He says, having investigated everything carefully, I have laid it out in consecutive order, O excellent Theophilus. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Do you think the guy is reasoning? Having investigated everything carefully, I've laid it out in consecutive order. Is there reason involved in that process? Yes. All right. Does he write a pure book with no mistakes in it? Don't leave me now. Come on, we still got a ways to go. The answer is yes. Does it take more than man's reasoning to do that? Yes. What must be coupled with man's reasoning for that to happen? The Holy Spirit flow, flow. Revelation of the Holy Spirit needs to be coupled with the reasoning of man. So you take Luke 1, 1 to 3, which is like reason carefully, and couple it with 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is inspired. So there was flow. He said, my reasoning capacity was being guided by flow. So under the word reasoning, here's what I'd like you to write. Write spirit-led reasoning. And I'd like to define for you what spirit-led reasoning is. It's what I believe we should do. It's what I do. All right? Spirit-led reasoning equals, put equals, and I'll tell you what it is. Spirit-led reasoning equals reasoning guided by flow. Let's say it together. Reasoning guided by flow. When we, when, we, when we say flow, we mean the flow of the Holy Spirit. We're talking the Romans, the John 7, 7, 39, flow. Reasoning guided by flow. It's what Einstein did. Got relaxed, tuned to flow. Reasoning guided by flow. I want to know God's thoughts. I want revelation knowledge. So that's what I do. with the left. The only way that the left side of my brain gets to be used is that way. I say, Holy Spirit, would you anoint my reasoning? I tune to flowing thoughts, flowing pictures, and allow flowing thoughts and flowing pictures to guide my reasoning process. That is the only way I've allowed it to be used for about 20 years now. I never think on my own saying, Mark, figure this out, because it won't be anywhere near as good as it would this way. When I was in college, I didn't know how to tune to flow. When I was in high school, I didn't know how to tune to tune to flow. I got straight B's all the way through college and high school. So I confessed over myself, I have a B-level brain. God said, Mark, don't ever say that again. He said, now that you've learned to yield your reasoning capacity to me, he said, you have a triple A brain. He said, you are brilliant. Say, I am brilliant. Because I yield my reasoning capacity to the flow of the Holy Spirit. I let flow guide my reasoning capacity. That is my choice. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's a really good choice. If you choose that and go with that, you'll be much more brilliant than you've ever been or ever dreamed you could be. Say, that works for me. <laughs> All right. That's how I present the left side of my brain. Now, how about if you're a right brainer, or, or when I'm using the right side, because we can obviously switch hemispheres back and forth. How do we present the right side of our brain to the Holy Spirit? So under imagination... How about if you write this, um, spirit anointed imagination or spirit anointed pictures, you can write it either way, spirit anointed pictures would be, put equals, spirit anointed pictures equals pictures guided by flow, equals pictures guided by flow. It's the same as the other side, it's just pictures. Pictures guided by the flow of the Holy Spirit. So I present my visionary capacity to the Holy Spirit. And I say, Holy Spirit, show me some pictures. And I tune to pictures, and pictures begin to flow within me. I say, that's neat. That's really great. I, didn't, I never thought of that picture. That's awesome. 
that's way beyond anything I could have pictured myself, all right? So I present the right side by taking the picturing capacity, presenting it to flow, the flow of the Holy Spirit, asking flow to guide it. Personally, that's the only way I use either side of my brain. For the last 20 years, that's the only way I allow it to be used. I used to use it myself, but I, I have not for a good 20 to 25 years. If that works for you, say amen. So say, if you want to confess this about the right side of the brain, you can confess this. Say, I choose to present my picturing capacity to the flow of the Holy Spirit. I invite the Holy Spirit to guide the pictures within me and to give me divine pictures. I trust that when I ask for them, I will receive them. Because the Bible says that when I ask for the Spirit, I receive the Spirit. I know it's God's will to give me dream and vision. So I receive that in simple faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You like it? Feels good. You got to believe something, confess something. You might just well confess that, amen? Truth as opposed to error. All right, a biblical example of a person presenting the right side of his brain. I gave you a biblical example for the left side. We had Luke, Luke 1, 1 to 3. That's a left manner, a left brainer getting revelation from God. How about a right brainer? How does he do it? Under imagination, if you want to put a scripture verse, put down Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And John says, here's how I got my book. <laughs> he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard a voice behind me saying, write in a book what you see. <laughs> Question. Is he reasoning at all? No. He's on the right side of his brain. He's just tuned to flow and writing away. There's no thinking at all going on here. Did he get a pure prophetic word from God? Yes. Did he use a different method than Luke? Yeah, Luke was a left brainer and flow came through the left side of his brain. John's a right brainer and flow came through the right side, which means there's at least two different ways to get revelation knowledge. A left brain approach and a right brain approach, which is kind of nice. So each one of us will probably have the approach that's strongest for us. The one strongest for me is the left brain approach, anointed reasoning. I've learned to move to the right side and just get stuff purely from the spirit realm. Some people who are more right brain, they, that's their primary way of getting stuff. They just tune to flow and it's just there all the time. Either, say either way is fine. Because we tend to judge people who do it different than us. You know, I, I look over at these right brainers and I say, my goodness, what a space cadet, you know? My, I mean, they never think, you know, they just open their mouth and, you know, there it is, you know. If they would just stop and think just a moment, you know. And, of course, they're looking across the aisle at me and saying, man, that guy is so stuck in the mud, you know. He couldn't get a prophetic word till he'd read 25 books and analyzed and made three charts. And by then, time God has moved on to something new anyways. My gosh, you know. So we tend to judge and scorn people who are different from us, but we don't need to. We can just honor the differentness. Say, I choose to honor the differentness. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to come back and teach you how I believe we're supposed to present both hemispheres of our brain to God. I wasn't taught that in college. wasn't taught that in high school. Um, I had to learn that through journaling. If that works for you, would you say amen? Go back to page 10 then, if you will. <clears throat> page 10, and we're trying to work our way through a teaching on spontaneity. Key number two, recognizing God's voice as spontaneous thoughts. Page 10, the top of the page, biblical support for the concept that spontaneous thoughts are the voice of the spirit realm. Let's ground this in scripture. Number one, all thoughts are not our thoughts. The Bible says that we're in a spiritual warfare. We fight against principalities and powers, and we take every what captive thought. Why do we have to take some thoughts captive? Because they come from where? Satan. If some thoughts come from Satan, where do you think some other thoughts in your head probably come from? God and the rest of the thoughts in your head come from where? Self. So we got... Three possible places that thoughts can come from. Now, you know, here's what I used to believe. I used to believe the thoughts in my head were my thoughts because it was my head. How many have held that position at one point in your life? I used to believe that, but that's not true because the Bible says I'm a vessel. What's the purpose of a vessel? To contain something, and therefore much of what's in me, it's not me, it's the one I contain. Amen? Took me a long time to figure that one out. I thought this was all me. He said, no, it's not you. 
All the flow within you is coming out of the spirit realm. The analytical stuff's coming from you, but the flow is coming from the spiritual realm. Positive flow is coming from the Holy Ghost. Negative flow is coming from Satan. The flow is coming from the spiritual realm. Number two. The word paga, let's say it together. Paga, that is a Hebrew word in the Old Testament. And it's the word for intercession. The Hebrew word for intercession is paga. It literally means to strike or light upon by chance or an accidental intersecting. If I was going to say, let me define intercession. Intercession is when you strike and light upon by chance. Intercession is when you actually intersect. Huh. I'm going to scratch your head and say, what? Huh. I thought intercession was praying for people. How in the world is intercession striking and lighted upon by chance? How is intercession an accidental intersecting? And here's what God said. He said, Mark, when I call you to pray for a person, when I call you to intercede for a person, I send thoughts that strike and light upon you by chance. They actually intersect your thought process. It's the voice of my spirit calling you to pray. If you've had that experience in your life, would you say amen? So here's what I said. I said, wow, I need to say this. I am honor chance encounter thoughts. You want to say it? I honor chance encounter thoughts. See, I've never said that before because I just scorned them all because they didn't come through the rational process and I was taught to worship rationalism. And so now I'm reversing my position in life. I honor chance encounter thoughts because they're coming from the river of God within me. Because they're coming from the river of God within me. Say that. Because they're coming from the river of God within me. I said this. Want to say this after me? I honor thoughts that accidentally intersect my thought process. Because it's the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Amen. Now that's a new idea. See, I never did that. I always said, chance encounter thoughts, get out of here. I am busy thinking. And I would throw them out the door and go back and worship the God of my culture, which was rationalism. And now I've renounced rationalism and say, no, no, Mark Verkler doesn't think, and he doesn't reason. You know why the reason doesn't reason? Because the Bible never commanded him to reason. I looked up every verse in the Bible on reason. There's not one commanding me to reason. How many of you know reason is the number one thing to talk you out of the revelation of God? You get some revelation, God said, I'm going to bless the world through your seed, and your brain says, I don't think so. How many have had your heart give you something great and your brain talk you out of it? If you have, say amen. See, that happened for 15, 20 years in my life. And when you have the same problem for 15 years, how many think it might be worth focusing on the problem and getting over it so you don't have to have it for the rest of your life? I said, you know, my reason's always attacking my faith and revelation knowledge, so I'm going to look up a verse in the Bible on reason to see if I'm doing something wrong and what I found out. And I said, I'm going to write a book on it. All right? Because I like to write books on what I discover. All right? And uh, I looked up a verse and found out I'm not commanded to reason. So the book is really a short book, okay? It's a one-liner. When reason challenges faith, reason is wrong. Simple as that, because when reason challenges faith, it's wrong because I was never commanded to reason. That's a one-liner book. See, that's free of charge. It didn't cost you anything, but that whole book, all right? Isn't that exciting? I don't reason. I have not reasoned for 20 years on my own. I let the Holy Spirit guide my reasoning process. Spirit-led reasoning I do, but not Mark Verkler's reasoning. All right, so Paga. Does a chance encounter thought, does that sound to you like a spontaneous thought? Like a flowing thought? It did to me, and I got pretty excited and said, wow, I honor chance encounter thoughts. So say it together one more time. I honor chance encounter thoughts. So I wake up in the morning, there's thoughts. During the day, there's thoughts. I, and I honor them, and I love the fact that I've learned to do that. The next, the next verse, number three, there's a river inside of us. John chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus said, Out of your innermost being shall what? Flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the what? Spirit. So when you want to tune to the Holy Spirit, according to that verse, what does he feel like inside of you? Tell me. He feels like a river which is flowing. He feels like flow. Does flow sound to you like spontaneity? Flowing thought, spontaneous thought. So I said, fine. I have a new confession now. I honor flow. Want to say it together? I honor flow because it's the river of God within me. 
I choose the river of God over myself. I choose the anointing over me in action. Because I like the anointing. It makes me better than I am. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. These are good choices. These are good prayers. And people say, okay, fine. So I'm tuned to flow, and I've got flowing thoughts and flowing pictures, but I'm not sure if the flow is me flowing, if it's a demon flowing, if it's the Holy Ghost flowing. I'm not really sure where the flow came from. Would you like to know how to be sure where the flow comes from? Well, you can be. You can know for sure because the verse that we just looked at, John 7, 37 and 39, tells us exactly how to be sure. So we'll look at the verse. And the last day, the Lord says, if you'll posture your heart properly, I promise the flow will be me. And here's the posture. We did cover it this morning for those who were here this morning. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if anyone, what? Thirst. Underline the word thirst and put a number one next to that. That's the first posture of my heart, the first required posture if I want the anointing. Okay? First required thought, a posture is, Lord, I'm thirsty for the anointing. I'm not thirsty for Mark Brooklyn's brilliance or his great brain in action. I am thirsty for the anointing of God upon my life. Number two, if any man is thirsty, let him do what? Come to me. Underline me. Underline, come to me. And that's number two. Put a number two next to it. Lord, not only am I thirsty for the anointing, I'm coming to Jesus for it. I'm not going to a crystal ball. I'm not going to Mohammed. I'm coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him to anoint me. Hallelujah. Number three, and drink. Underline the word drink and say, Lord, I'm tuning to flow. Because when I drink, there's a flow of liquid, liquid that goes within me. And so I say, Lord, I'm tuning to flow. I'm thirsty for the anointing. I'm coming to you, Lord Jesus, asking for it. And I'm tuning to flow because you're a river that within me. That's requirement number three. Number four, and he who, what? Believes. Underline the word believes. And I say, Lord, I believe the river in me is you. I don't doubt it. I don't wonder. I believe it's you. I don't think it's a fairy tale. I don't think it's make-believe. I believe it's really there. Say, I believe it's really there. Hallelujah. All right. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, what? Will flow. Underline, put a box around the word will flow. Box around the word will. Asterisk next to the word will. Did he say might or will? He said, this is a guarantee. He said, I guarantee you, if you posture your heart properly, the flow you get will be coming from me. If you like that guarantee, say hallelujah. Man, I love it. Because Satan says, oh, I don't think so. I say, go to a warmer climate. <laughs> Doubt, leave. Say it with me. Doubt, leave in the name of Jesus. Say that. In the name of Jesus. All right, the whole thing. One more time. Doubt, leave in the name of Jesus. One more time. Doubt, leave. Leave in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to say it, and you need to say it to your heart. Get and say, I got it. <laughs> I think I understand now. Because, you know, repetition is good for the heart. The Psalms, they would repeat the same thing over and over till his heart. You say, how many times do you repeat it? Till your heart says, bingo, I got it, I believe now. Your head said, I heard it the first time. But your heart says, say it a bunch more times. You say it until your heart has a breakthrough. It says, I got it. All right, hallelujah. If you like that verse, say amen. See, I love that verse. Amen, amen. All right. Um, out of my innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. I want you to go to page 14, if you will. We're going to journal as we close here tonight, and we're going to come back and pick up the teaching tomorrow morning, right where we left off on spontaneity. We just covered half of it tonight and half tomorrow morning. All right. Top of page 14, personal application, a chance to journal. Take five or ten minutes to complete the journaling exercise below. Write down a question you'd like to ask the Lord. It can be any question you choose as long as it's not one of the most traumatic questions of your life. Because the Bible doesn't say be traumatized and know that I'm God. The Bible says be still. So do not ask him traumatic questions. Don't ask him who you're going to marry or when the Antichrist is coming, you know. 
save all those till I have left, and, and John or not is going to help you with those after I've gone back to Buffalo, all right? We're going to ask non-traumatic questions tonight. Say non-traumatic. Okay, here are three non-traumatic questions in the middle of the paragraph. You can underline any one you want to ask him. Lord, do you love me? Lord, how do you see me? Lord, what would you like to say to me? Why don't you underline one of those three questions? Lord, do you love me? Lord, how do you see me? Lord, what would you like to say to me? Lord, do you love me? Lord, how do you see me? Lord, what would you like to say to me? Underline the question you want to ask the Lord. And I'd like to lead us in a prayer time where we meet with Jesus. Okay? And when I'm done in this prayer time, I'm going to leave you with Jesus at the Sea of Galilee. I want you to tune to flow and just write for about five minutes whatever the Lord's giving to you. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you've not left us alone, but you've given us the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we honor your presence here in this room tonight. We honor you as the river within us, as the one who anoints our eyes that we can see Jesus, who anoints our ears that we can hear him. And so, Holy Spirit, we celebrate your life in the midst of the church. Holy Spirit, right now we ask that you anoint each one of our eyes and anoint our ears that we might see and hear. I'd like you to look for a picture in your mind of you and Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee on a very beautiful, warm summer day. As you walk along the seashore, you can see the hillside of Galilee that's flowing with green grass, which is blowing gently in the breeze. As you look out across the Sea of Galilee, you can see the shimmering surface of the water, and the sun is dancing and reflecting off from it. Way out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, you can see a fisherman in his boat, just spending some time alone with his creator. As you look up in the sky, you can see a very beautiful, soft blue sky. Some soft white clouds are drifting lazily by. You can feel a gentle, warm breeze just blowing against your back as you walk along with Jesus. You can feel the sun just warming you all the way through. As you look over at Jesus, you can see his long flowing white robes and the sandals on his feet. You can feel his love just reaching out to you, just engulfing you like a cocoon. He is so glad to be with you. The reason he died on Calvary was to restore a love relationship with you. So I'd like you to put a big smile on your face and, and just say, thank you, Lord, for being here. And you may find that you put your hand in his hand as you walk along, and if that happens, that's fine. You may even turn into a young child. If that happens, that's fine, too. Let's just tune to flow for a moment. And Holy Spirit, just take over these scenes and just let Jesus come alive and do whatever he wants to do. Just watch. Maybe you'll dance in the field with him, or maybe you'll skim rocks in the water. But just watch for a few moments. Do the journaling. Ask the Lord what the question is. Fix your, eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus and write what He gives you. And we will end the audio there. Praise God. Praise God. 
a great lesson tonight, a great lesson tonight. I thank God for all of you for being a part of this lesson. I hope you learn a lot tonight. Apply what you've learned. And um, we're going to ask you if you want to, if you have any questions, unmute your phone, ask any questions, make any comments. Then we will close out for this evening. You all are going to get out before 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, yes, Dr. Carter. Yes, Roy. Uh, I have a question about the uh, murmuring, the muttering, and the roaring. Yes. Is this something that you do more privately, um, I would guess, as opposed to doing this around other people? Yes, I, 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 I agree with you there. Um, unless you're in a service where everyone is, okay, the leader of the service, okay, everyone, we're going to pray for this situation, and I want everyone to pray, who prays in tongues to pray in tongues, then you do it publicly. But normally, normally, Roy, you're going to murmur, uh, murmuring maybe groaning in the spirit. Murmuring may be the Holy Spirit groaning. Mm, you're groaning and travailing in the spirit. Or you may be in, in, in your privacy. See, when, when it comes to uh, praying in tongues, everybody does not pray in tongues. So we do not want to offend. According to 1 Corinthians, we do not want to offend or violate those members of the body of Christ who do not have that gift. So there are times, and like on your job, you're not going to pray in tongues out loud on your job. You're going to lose your job, right, Roy? <laughs> okay. You, you go around on your, your job. You're going to lose your job. They're going to say he's out of his mind because the world yeah. doesn't understand Yeah, that. probably. So, yes, yes, there are times when you use your wisdom. Uh, let the Holy Spirit guide you. And uh, there are some things you're going to do private between you and God, okay? Well, uh, I, I don't think I've ever experienced that before in my, uh, in my life yet, but uh, maybe. Well, as we go along, as we go along, the Lord's been impressing me in the last couple of days that we, we're, we may have a session after this course, just a, a call, a call session, and uh, for, for um, especially for believers who have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost and want the Holy Ghost baptism with <clears throat> with the gift of speaking in tongues, and we're going to have a class on that. That'll be beyond this particular course. So at that particular time, should the Lord lead us to do that, we, I'll, I'll let you know. And, and, and those who want, want to be a part of it can, can come and, and, and get the enjoyment of, 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 of an aspect of right brain worship and praise that many of the body of Christ do not do not. Uh, do not have and do not exercise, but uh, it's available. I have a question. Okay, back to Roy first. Roy, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, Jackie. Okay, so if sometimes when you are deeply communing with God, you're in your relationship with God and he's speaking to you and you are so moved um, maybe tears flow or you cry out to him is that the same thing? That you're just constantly um, verbalizing back to him but it, I mean it may not be tongues but is that similar? Yes, yes, yes. See, everybody in the body of Christ is different, and every one of us responds to the Holy Spirit differently. There are many who respond uh, in like manner in a situation, but each of us, there is no clone of any one of us. We're all made in his image, and if any person is in Christ, he or she is a new creation, totally different from anyone else who's been recreated okay so some people respond by crying some people respond by laughing some respond by getting up and running in place okay every response is not different so the way you respond uh, to the presence 
and the overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit may be different from the way I respond. You may break out in tears. Tears may flow out of your eyes. Uh, yesterday I was listening to a tape in another course and, and tears start flowing out of my eyes. I, I said, wow, I haven't experienced anything like this in a long time. So the response responses are different. It doesn't have to always be in tongues. It also doesn't have to always be in a different language. It, it uh, doesn't have to be any kind of movement, a dance, or or even articulation of words. Sometimes uh, it might be a groaning in your in your innermost being, and you you hear the groaning, mm, mm, and you feel the the sweetness of that groaning, and you you even sense the the power of, of healing rising up in you. So each person is different. Okay, Jackie? Yes, thank you. And, and, and I ask that because sometimes people are led to believe that if you don't speak in tongues, then you don't have the right relationship with God. No, no, that but is an you, error. But you clarified that. Praise God. Jackie, that's an error that many uh, people began teaching, especially during the charismatic movement, the 1970s. A lot of charismatics began emphasizing the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then some of the teachers, the prophets, even the teachers and the pastors went off the deep end. And then they began teaching an error. If you don't have the gift of tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost. What a big error. What a big and and that caused great division in the body of Christ. Because when you read the scriptures the scripture says everybody does not speak in tongues. The scripture, that's why we teach people to read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Even in 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. I ain't nothing but a noise maker. And we got a lot of noise makers in the body of Christ who have hurt other people, offended other people by adding their twist to the word of God. We're not to add to this word of God. We're not to add a twist to it. The scriptures teach us in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 14, that uh, the Holy Ghost gives gifts to the body of Christ as he wills. All And the scripture says, all do not speak in tongues. Some have the gift of helps. Some have the gifts of administration. Some have the gift of healing. Some can cast out demons, but everybody in the body of Christ does not have the same gift. So the Holy Spirit, we dishonor and the church has dishonored the Holy Ghost by teaching that madness over the years that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost. What a, what a divisive spirit. Satan took that and messed up a lot of people. So there are a lot of people in the body of Christ who do not speak in tongues. And because I do speak in tongues, that does not mean I have more than they or I'm any better than they. We all need to humble ourselves and read the scriptures. Even Paul said, Paul even taught in, 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 in uh, his epistle. He said, I speak in tongues more than any of you. He said, but I know when to and when not to. And so, Jackie, it's a whole thing about ignorance of the word of God. Come back with me, Jackie. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I just wanted to, um, to, that to bring that up. Clear? So Yes, thank you. Mark Wolverton, was that clear? Body of Christ, was that clear? Very clear. Very clear. So, so we've we've a lot of us have some if we could go back, we yeah. could mend some broken bridges. Oh, uh, the church has hurt a lot of people by and what they've done, what they've done, ladies and gentlemen, over the years is establish a first class church and a second class church because you don't speak in tongues you're second class church and then we had charismatics looking down the noses at others okay so you're charismatic you're you're praying in tongues you're laying hands on the sick you're casting out demons but you're sleeping with your neighbor's wife come on now mm -hmm. 
Come on now. I don't want to get into that, but but the church has taken the teachings of the Lord and because and, be, and 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 the believers have responsibility too because believers are ignorant of the word of God. If you don't study the word of God, you'll never know. And you'll take anything that comes down the pipe. That's why I challenge pastors. When a pastor's preaching, I open my Bible. And and because I know some Bible and, and I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit, I'm prayerfully listening as a pastor's preaching or as a teacher's teaching. I'm prayerfully listening so that anything the devil tries to twist and put in there that ain't of God, I want to be able to discern it and pick it up and cast down those vain imaginations. Any other questions or comments? I think I worked with that a little bit. Did I, Jackie? Yes, dear. Don't let anybody intimidate you. And this is for everybody out there. Don't let any believer intimidate you. Just because they've got big ministry or they've, they're popular or they're riding the crest of the wave and you're struggling trying to memorize uh, Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, and because they can quote the whole book of Isaiah, don't let anybody intimidate you. Nobody in the body of Christ has more than what you have because Jesus died for every one of us and the gifts are given by the Holy Spirit to each one of us as the Holy Spirit wills. He chooses the gifts that you have. So if you don't know what your gifts are, find out what the gifts are. Um, uh, Lord, just put on my heart today, let's add to the Paul Begley School of Prophecy a new course next semester add add this course understanding your spiritual gifts and we're going to do that too thanks jackie for oh, firing me up yes. you got me fired up i might not be able to sleep you got to come home and and, and 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 talk me into my sleep anybody else By the uh, way, listeners, I, listeners, that was my wife, Jackie. I was just talking with her, okay? <laughs> yes, Patricia. I would, um, yes, hi. Um, I, I wanted just to add what you were saying. It, it's like um, that's when this class is so important and hearing from God's voice to tell us when and when not to do something. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes. Yes, Pat Patricia, that is why Mark Verkler emphasizes, and we emphasize uh, the Holy Spirit, the word Naba, uh, 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 bubbling up in us like rivers of living water. Okay, listening to the voice of the Spirit rather than rather than taking everything from prophet so and so. Uh, or pastor so and so because they're well named, well named and established. They got all kinds of books and tapes, but they can be wrong sometimes, and and many have led people into error. But we have the responsibility to hear God's voice for ourselves. And even if we don't understand, we He loves us so much. He's our heavenly Father. Jesus died that we have this relationship with Him. So that we can ask God anything. And God will speak to us on it. That's the relationship we have. That's love. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, Patricia, uh, brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. don't let anybody intimidate you. Some, uh, and, 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 and don't let congregations intimidate you because, you know, hey, there's a movement. The, the fire's burning over First Baptist and, and there's, a, there, there's a flood of healings and miracles. And then, and First Baptist members start looking down on Second Baptist because y'all ain't got what we got. Come on, that has been so divisive yeah. since the <laughs> beginning of time. But don't be intimidated. Just remember, you have a relationship with God. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus and rest in that and worship God. Don't be, you are not a second class Christian. You're a second to none. Oh, y'all got me fired up. See, Jackie, you got me all messed up. Now I'm going to have to try to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> Praise God. Anybody else? <laughs> Mark Wolverton, lead us in prayer. Would you please close us out in prayer?
Mark, are you still there? Mark said, hey, I'm, I'm out, I've been out of here. Mark, Hello? Marcus, lead us in prayer, please. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Well, bless each one here tonight. We thank you for the words that have been spoken, the joy that we feel in our spirit tonight. I ask you just to anoint uh, each, each one of these students and allow you to speak to their hearts even tonight as they sleep. May you just speak into them. We thank you, Lord, that you do speak to your children and that we do hear your voice and, and you know us by name. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you all.